Chapter 20, Intimbi, Caring for Clients with Upper Respiratory Disorders. Learning Objectives. Describe nursing care for clients experiencing infectious or inflammatory upper respiratory disorders. Discuss assessment data required to provide nursing care to clients with structural disorders of the upper airway. Describe airway problems a client may experience following trauma or obstruction to the upper airway. Identify risk factors that contribute to the development of laryngeal cancer. Identify the earliest symptom of laryngeal cancer. Discuss treatments for laryngeal cancer. Describe measures used to promote alternative methods of communication for clients with a laryngectomy. Discuss psychosocial issues that clients may experience following a laryngectomy. Relate treatment modalities for clients experiencing short-term or long-term problems with airway management. Identify possible reasons for and nursing management of a tracheostomy. Explain why a client may require endotracheal intubation. Infectious and inflammatory disorders. Rhinitis is inflammation of the nasal mucous membranes. It's also referred to as the common cold or coryza. Coryza, C-O-R-Y-Z-A. Rhinitis may be acute, chronic, or allergic, depending on the cause. The most common cause is the rhinovirus, of which there are more than 100 strains. Colds are rapidly spread by inhalation of droplets and direct contact with contaminated articles, such as telephone receivers and doorknobs. Allergic rhinitis is a hypersensitive reaction to allergens, such as pollen, dust, animal dander, or food. Rhinitis is usually not a serious condition, however, it may lead to pneumonia and other more serious illnesses for debilitated, immunosuppressed, or older clients. Symptoms associated with rhinitis include sneezing, nasal congestion, rhinorrhea, which is clear nasal discharge, sore throat, watery eyes, cough, low-grade fever, headache, aching muscles, and malaise. But the common cold these symptoms continue for five to 14 days. A sustained elevated temperature suggests a bacterial infection or infection in the sinuses or ears. Symptoms of allergic rhinitis will persist as long as the client is exposed to the specific allergen. For most clients, treatment for rhinitis is minimal unless specific bacteria are identified as the cause of the infection, antibiotics are not used. Clients may be advised to use antipyretics such as acetaminophen or non-steroidal analgesics for fever. Decongestants such as sudafrin may be re recommended for severe nasal congestion. For clients experiencing a prolonged cough, antitussives may be ordered. Saline gargles are useful for a sore throat, as is saline spray for nasal congestion and prevention of crusting. For allergic rhinitis, antihistamines are often used. An example of a first-generation antihistamine is diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl. Newer antihistamines include lor loratadine, claritin, fexofenadine, which is Allegra, and cetirizine, which is Zyrtec. Combination decongestants and antihistamines may also be helpful. An example of this is Dimetap. Medications that desensitize or suppress immune responses, such as chromalin, which is also called nasal crom, or intranasal glucosteroids such as flutacazone or flonase may also be prescribed for allergic rhinitis. The nurse teaches the client simple measures to treat rhinitis. Teaching clients about upper respiratory infections helps prevent them and minimizes potential complications. Maintaining a healthy lifestyle of adequate rest and sleep, proper diet, and moderate exercise is the best prevention. Another important preventive factor is frequent hand washing, which greatly reduces the spread of infection. Teaching for older clients must include potential side effects of over-the-counter medicines such as antihistamines or cough suppressants. Antihistamines may increase dryness and contribute to confusion or dizziness, which increases falls. These OTC medications may also prevent effective airway clearance by cough production, especially in those who have weakened respiratory musculature. Specifically, sudephrine side effects are potentially serious, and the following should be reported to the healthcare provider. Low blood pressure, heart palpitations or rapid heart rate, chest tightness, confusion, 
hallucinations, visual changes, seizures, or other signs that could indicate an allergic reaction. Older adults must carefully weigh the potential risks and benefits of steroid use. The intended benefit of decreasing inflammation may be warranted in some situations. However, the potential risk of tissue thinning may contribute to GI bleeding or prolonged use may be a factor in the development of avascular necrosis of hip joints. Sinusitis, also known as rhinosinusitis, is inflammation of the sinuses. It may be classified according to its duration. Acute sinusitis generally lasts less than four weeks. Subacute sinusitis does not get better with initial treatment and generally lasts four to eight weeks. Chronic sinusitis occurs with repeated acute infections or inadequately treated infections and can last more than 12 weeks. Recurrent sinusitis refers to three or more episodes in one year. The maxillary sinus is affected most often. Sinusitis can lead to serious complications such as infection of the middle ear or brain. The principal causes are the spread of an infection from the nasal passages to the sinuses and the blockage of normal sinus drainage. The infection can be bacterial or viral, generally occurring after an upper respiratory infection or with allergic rhinitis. Interference with sinus drainage predisposes a client to sinusitis because trapped secretions readily become infected. Other conditions that may interfere with sinus drainage. Structural abnormalities such as nasal polyps or a deviated septum, enlarged adenoids, diving and swimming, tooth infections, trauma to the nose, foreign objects stuck in the nose, and secondhand smoke. Measures that help reduce the incidence or severity of sinusitis including, include eating a well-balanced diet, getting plenty of rest, and engaging in moderate exercise, avoiding allergens, and seeking medical attention promptly if a cold lasts longer than 10 days or nasal discharge is green or dark yellow and foul smelling. Assessment findings. Signs and symptoms depend on which sinus is infected. They include headache, fever, pain over the affected sinus, nasal congestion and discharge, post-nasal drip causing a cough, pain and pressure around the eyes, and malaise. A nasal smear or material obtained from irrigation of the sinus for culture and sensitivity identifies the infectious microorganism and appropriate antibiotic therapy. Transillumination and x-rays of the sinuses may show a change in the shape of or fluid in the sinus cavity. A thorough history, including an allergy history, usually confirms the diagnosis. In some instances, nasal endoscopy may be done and or imaging studies such as CT scans or MRIs. Medical and surgical management. Medical management for acute sinusitis focuses on shrinking the nasal mucosa, relieving pain, and treating infection. Acute sinusitis frequently responds to conservative treatment designed to help overcome the infection. Intranasal saline irrigation or lavage of the maxillary sinus may be done to remove accumulated exudate and promote drainage. Such irrigation is accomplished by the insertion of a catheter through the normal opening under the middle conchia, or concha, C-O-N-C-H-A. Antibiotic therapy is necessary for severe infections, but may not be prescribed for 10 to 14 days if symptoms are not severe. Vasoconstrictors such as phenylephrine nose drops may be recommended for short-term use to relieve nasal congestion and aid in sinus drainage. Nasal corticosteroids such as Nasonex may be ordered for relief of sinus congestion. Nasal saline sprays or oral decongestants may be recommended. Surgery may be indicated for chronic sinusitis. Fun functional endoscopic sinus surgery helps provide an opening in the interior inferior meatus to promote drainage. Image guided endoscopy surgery uses CT scanning with infrared lights to assure that placement of the surgical instruments is accurate and will not endanger the eyes, optic nerve, brain, or major arteries. More radical procedures such as the caldwell luke procedure and external sphenoethmoidectomy are done to remove diseased tissue and provide an opening from the maxillary sinus into the inferior meatus of the nose for adequate drainage. Nursing management, the nurse informs the client receiving medical treatment 
that use of mouthwashes and humidification as well as increased fluid intake may loosen secretions and increase comfort. The nurse instructs the client to take nasal decongestants as recommended. If the client has had sinus surgery, the nurse institutes standards for post-op care and observes the client for a repeated swallowing, a finding that suggests possible hemorrhage. One risk of sinus surgery is damage to the optic nerve. The nurse assesses post-operative visual acuity by asking the client to identify the number of fingers displayed. The nurse monitors the client's temperature at least every four hours, assessing for pain over the involved sinuses, a finding that may indicate post-op infection or impaired drainage. The nurse administers analgesics as indicated and applies ice compresses to involved sinuses to reduce pain and swelling. Post-surgical client will have nasal packing and a dressing under the nares, a mustache dressing or a drip pad. Again, nursing post-operative care, observe for repeated swallowing, which indicates hemorrhage, optic nerve function assessment, showing fingers, ask them how many fingers they can, they can see, temperature every four hours, pain over involved sinuses, could um, be infection, administer analgesics as indicated, and ice compresses, nasal packing and dressing under nares, called a mustache dressing or a drop pad dressing. Which of the following statements made by a client with sinusitis would indicate to the nurse that further teaching is required? A, I use a warm mist humidifier at night. B is, I take my decongestants when the doctor ordered. C, I will call the physician if my fever comes back. D, I will put ice packs on my nose three times a day. Your answer should be D, I will put ice packs on my nose three times a day. The rationale is application of ice packs is not a standard treatment for sinusitis. The statement needs clarification for the client. So in other words, that is the incorrect answer from the client. Post-op sinusitis continues. The nurse instructs the client to change the drip pad as needed. In the first 24 hours, the client can expect to change this pad frequently. If bleeding is copious and or continuous, the doctor must be called. After 24 hours, the drainage normally decreases significantly. The client needs to report if excessive drainage persists. Postoperatively, the client needs to report also um, any increase in pain or fever. Don't blow the nose. Don't lift objects more than five to 10 pounds or do the Valsalva maneuver for 10 to 14 days post-op. Airline travel must be avoided for two weeks. The nurse urges the client to remain in a warm environment and to avoid smoky or poorly ventilated areas. Pharyngitis. Inflammation of the throat is often associated with rhinitis and other upper respiratory infections. Viruses and bacteria cause pharyngitis. The most serious bacteria are the group A, streptococci, which is causing a condition commonly referred to as strep throat. Strep throat can lead to dangerous cardiac complications called endocarditis and rheumatic fever, and harmful renal complications, which is called glomerulonephritis. Pharyngitis is highly contagious and spreads via inhalation or of direct contamination with droplets. The incubation period for pharyngitis is two to four days. The first symptom is a sore throat, sometimes severe, with accompanying dysphagia, D-Y-S-P-H-A-G-I-A, -A, which is difficulty swallowing, fever, chills, headache, and malaise. Some clients exhibit a white or exudate patch over the tonsillar area and swollen glands. A throat culture reveals the specific cause to, uh, to bacteria. Rapid antigen tests can detect strep within minutes by determining that there are foreign substances or called antigens in the throat. If positive, treatment can begin right away. This test is not perfect, however, and may miss some strep infections. In this case, the primary healthcare provider may rely on the throat culture. In addition, there is a rapid DNA test that uses DNA technology to identify strep bacteria in less than a day with equal accuracy and in less time than traditional throat cultures. These tests are done in clinics and physicians offices. Early antibiotic treatment is the best choice for pharyngitis to treat the infection and help prevent potential complications. Penicillin or its derivatives are generally the antibiotics of choice. 
Clients sensitive to penicillin receive, receive erythromycin, a cephalosporin such as cephalexin called Keflex, or azithromycin called Zithromax. The antibiotic regimen is generally 5 to 14 days. Again, looking at this picture of uh, pharyngitis, the assessment findings are sore throat, dysphagia, fever, headache, white or exudate patch over tonsillar area, swollen glands, a red beefy uh, look to the throat, and medical management includes throat culture and antibiotic treatment, such as erythromycin. Tonsillitis is the inflammation of the tonsils, and adenoitis is inflammation of the adenoids. These conditions generally occur together. The common diagnosis is tonsillitis. Although both disorders are more common in children, they may also be seen in adults. Tonsils and adenoids are lymphatic tissues and common sites of infection. Primary infection may occur in the tonsils or adenoids, or the infection can be secondary to other upper respiratory infections. Chronic tonsillar infection leads to enlargement and partial upper airway obstruction. Chronic adenoidal infection can result in acute or chronic infection in the middle ear, which is called otitis media. If the causative, or causative organism is group A streptococcus, prompt treatment is needed to prevent potential cardiac and renal complications. Assessment findings. Assessment findings include sore throat, difficulty or pain on swallowing, fever and malaise. Enlarged adenoids may produce nasal obstruction, noisy breathing, snoring, and a nasal quality to the voice. Visual exam reveals enlarged and reddened tonsils. White patches may appear on the tonsils if group A strep are the cause. A throat culture and sensitivity test determines the causative microorganism and appropriate antibiotic therapy. Medical and surgical management. Antibiotic therapy for bacterial tonsillitis. Analgesics such as acetaminophen and saline gargles may be used to treat the infection and associated discomfort. Chronic tonsillitis and adenoiditis may require tonsillectomy, operative removal of the tonsils, and adenoidectomy, which is operative removal of the adenoids. The criteria for performing these procedures are repeated episodes of tonsillitis usually more than seven in a year or four to five times a year for two years in a row or three times a year for three years in a row. Sleep disorders related to obstructive breathing, hypertrophy of the tonsils, enlarged obstructed adenoids, repeated purulent otitis media, hearing loss related to serious to serous otitis media associated with enlarged tonsils and adenoids and other conditions such as asthma and rheumatic fever exasperated by tonsillitis. Tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy are generally done as outpatient procedures. Recovery time is generally at least 10 days to two weeks or longer, especially for adults. Tonsillitis and adenoiditis. Nursing management is pre-care and post-care. Also, lab results include a hematocrit, platelet count, clotting time, aspirin use, and EDSEDS. Nursing diagnoses include risk for aspiration, risk for impaired tissue integrity, and acute pain. These are all based on a post-op or a surgical situation of removal of the tonsils and adenoids. After a client undergoes surgery to the upper respiratory tract, the nurse should monitor the client for A, infection, B, patent airway, C, bleeding, or D, septicemia. Your answer should be patent airway. The rationale is the airway is always the primary assessment to be made after surgery. Peritonsillar abscess is an abscess that develops in the connective tissue between the capsule of the tonsil and the constrictor muscle of the pharynx. It may follow a severe streptococcal or staphylococcal tonsillar infection. Clients with a peritonsillar abscess experience difficulty in pain with swallowing, fever, malaise, air, ear pain, and difficulty talking. On visual examination, the affected site is red and swollen, as is the posterior pharynx. Drainage from the abscess is cultured to identify the microorganism. Sensitivity studies determine the appropriate antibiotic therapy. 
Immediate treatment of a peritonsillar abscess is recommended to prevent the spread of the causative microorganism to the bloodstream or adjacent structures. Penicillin or another antibiotic is given immediately after a culture is obtained and before results of the culture and sensitivity tests are known. Needle aspiration, preferred because it is less invasive and less painful, or surgical incision and drainage of the abscess are done if the abscess partially blocks the oropharynx. A local anesthetic is sprayed or painted on the surface of the abscess and the contents are evacuated. Repeated episodes may necessitate a tonsillectomy. Nursing management of the client undergoing needle aspiration or incision and drainage of an abscess includes placing the client in a semi-fowler's position to prevent aspiration. An ice collar may be ordered to reduce swelling and pain. Clients may have topical anesthetic agents and throat irrigations with warm saline or alkaline solutions every one to two hours. They may also use similar solutions or mouthwash for gentle gargling. The nurse also instructs the client to be upright and to expectorate in a forward direction over a sink or basin. The nurse encourages the client to drink fluids that are cool or at room temperature and observes the client for signs of respiratory obstruction such as dyspnea, restlessness or cyanosis, or excessive bleeding. Laryngitis is an inflammation and swelling of the mucous membrane that lines the larynx. Edema of the vocal cords frequently accompanies laryngeal inflammation. Laryngitis may follow an upper respiratory infection and results from spread of the infection to the larynx. Other causes include excessive or improper use of the voice, allergies, and smoking. Hoarseness, inability to speak above a whisper, or aphonia, which is complete loss of voice, are the usual symptoms. Aphonia is A-P-H-O-N-I-A. -A. Clients also complain of throat irritation and a dry, non-productive cough. The diagnosis is based on the symptoms. If hoarseness persists more than two weeks, the larynx is, is examined with a laryngoscopy. Persistent horse, hoarseness is a sign of laryngeal cancer and thus merits prompt investigation. Treatment involves voice rest and treatment or removal of the cause. Antibiotic therapy may be used if a bacterial infection is the cause. If smoking is the cause, the nurse encourages smoking cessation and refers the client to a smoking cessation program. Epistaxis. Epistax epistaxis or nosebleed is a common occurrence. It is not usually serious but can be scary. Nosebleeds are the rupture of tiny capillaries in the nasal mucous membrane. They occur most commonly in the anterior septum, referred to as Kieselbach's plexus. Risk factors associated with nosebleeds include trauma, systemic infections such as rheumatic fever, local infections, and dry nasal mucosa, hypertension, use of aspirin, nasal tumors, and blood dyscrasias. Epistaxis that results from hypertension or blood dyscrasias is likely to be severe and difficult to control. Those who abuse cocaine or other inhaled drugs may have frequent nosebleeds. Foreign bodies in the nose and deviated septum contribute to epistaxis along with forceful nose blowing and frequent or aggressive nose picking. Inspection of the nares using a nasal speculum and light reveals the area of bleeding. The examiner uses a tongue blade to check the back of the throat and a laryngeal mirror to view the area above and behind the uvula. Medical and surgical management. The severity and location of the bleeding determines the treatment. One or a combination of the following therapies may be used. Direct continuous pressure to the nares for 5 to 10 minutes with the client sitting upright with head tilted forward to prevent swallowing and aspiration of blood. Application of ice packs to the nose, cauterization with silver nitrate, electrocautery, or applications of a topical vasoconstrictor such as 1 to 1000 epinephrine, nasal packing with a cotton tampon, pressure with a balloon inflated catheter inserted posteriorly for a minimum of 48 hours. Nursing management. The nurse monitors 
vital signs and assesses for evidence of continued bleeding. The nurse may initiate measures to control bleeding, such as applying pressure and ice packs. Other treatments require a doctor's order. The client experiencing epistaxis is usually anxious and requires reassurance. If underlying conditions are the cause, the nurse refers to the client for medical follow-up. The nurse may also recommend humidification, use of a nasal lubricant to keep the mucosa membranes moist, and avoidance of vigorous nose blowing and nose picking or other nose trauma. The nurse is teaching first aid class for parents. The topic is treatment for a nosebleed. One of the parents indicates a need for further teaching with the following statement. Pinch the soft part of the nose firmly, flush the nose with warm water, Apply ice to the back of the neck or to the nose. Consult a physician as needed. Flush the nose with warm water. Rationale. Warm fluids flushed into the nose should be avoided as it will cause dilation of the blood vessels and could exacerbate the bleeding. Trauma and obstruction of upper airway. Nasal obstruction. The pathophysiology and etiology is a deviated septum, nasal polyps, or grape-like swellings, and hypertrophied turbinates. Assessment findings will be a history of sinusitis, difficulty breathing out of one nostril, and frequent nosebleeds. Medical management is steroidal nasal spray. Surgical management would be submucous surgical resection, septoplasty, rhinoplasty, and nose reconstruction. Nursing management includes nasal packing, mouth breathing, care, semi-fowler's position, vital signs, and frequent oral hygiene. Fractures of the nose. Pathophysiology and etiology is from trauma. Assessment findings is swelling and edema of soft tissue, external and internal bleeding, nasal deformity, nasal obstruction, and if there's fluid draining from the nose, it could be CSF and you want to use a dextro sticks to check for glucose because that would be an indicator of cerebrospinal fluid if the plate at the base of the um, nose is broken. Medical management is pressure applied to stop the bleeding, cold compresses, surgical management for complex fractures is very involved and it usually takes a week to two weeks with a packing uh, in place. Nursing management is head of bed elevated, apply ice, analgesics, assess for airway obstruction, pupillary responses, level of consciousness, and periorbital edema, and anxiety. Laryngeal trauma and laryngeal obstruction. Laryngeal trauma occurs during motor vehicle accidents when the neck strikes the steering wheel or other blunt trauma occurs in the neck region. Endoscopy and endotracheal intubations are other possible causes. Although uncommon, a fracture of the thyroid cartilage is also traumatic to the larynx. Laryngeal obstruction is an extremely serious and often life-threatening condition. Some causes of upper airway obstruction include swelling from an allergic reaction, severe head and neck injury, severe inflammation and edema of the throat, and aspiration of foreign bodies. Assessment findings, signs and symptoms. Laryngeal trauma causes neck swelling, bruising, and tenderness. If the tissues surrounding the larynx are greatly swollen, the client will exhibit stridor, a high-pitched, harsh sound during respiration, indicative of airway obstruction. The client also has dysphagia, hoarseness, and cyanosis, and possible hemoptysis, which is expectoration of bloody sputum. Total obstruction prevents the passage of air from the upper to lower respiratory airway. Choking clients will clutch their throats, the universal distress sign for choking. Unless total obstruction is relieved immediately, death occurs from respiratory arrest. Partial obstruction results in difficulty breathing. Medical and surgical management and diagnostic findings the laryngoscopy reveals the extent of trauma and internal swelling. X-rays and oxygenation studies will be performed after a patent airway has been established. Maintenance of a patent airway is crucial. If the client has aspirated a foreign body, 
abdominal thrusts are initiated to force the object out of the re upper respiratory passages. Allergic reactions resulting in severe inflammation and edema may be treated with epinephrine or a corticosteroid and possible intubation. Severe obstruction requires an emergency tracheostomy, which is a surgical opening into the trachea. Obstructive sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea, a OSA, is characterized by recurrent and frequent episodes of upper airway obstruction and reduced ventilation. Apnea, which is cessation of breathing, occurs as a result of upper airway obstruction, generally when the tongue collapses against the soft palate and in turn the soft palate collapses against the back of the throat. Central sleep apnea is not a result of obstruction, but rather occurs because the brain fails to signal the muscles to breathe. It is not as common and is usually the result of a specific medical condition or medications. Complex sleep apnea is a combination of the two conditions. Obstructive sleep apnea is the most common and will be the primary focus for this discussion. According to the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, an estimated 12 to 18 million Americans have obstructive sleep apnea, OSA, with half of those affected classified as overweight. Sleep apnea affects one out of 25 middle-aged men and one out of 50 middle-aged women. Women are more likely to have sleep apnea after menopause. In general, as people age, they are at higher risk for sleep apnea, with one out of every 10 people over 65 years of age diagnosed with sleep apnea. Other factors that may predispose people to sleep apnea are ethnicity. African Americans, Hispanics, and Pacific Islanders are more likely to develop sleep apnea. Heredity and having smaller airways, allergies, or other conditions that contribute to increased congestion can also be the case. Cigarette smokers are at increased risk, as are clients with any condition that reduces pharyngeal muscle tone, a neuromuscular disease, a use of sedative or hypnotic medicines, and frequent and heavy intake of alcohol. OSA results from a reduced diameter of the upper airway, which may develop when the upper airway collapses secondary to the alternative, excuse me, to the normally reduced muscle tone during sleep. The repeated apneic spells have serious effects on the cardiopulmonary system. Clients with sleep apnea often have hypertension and are therefore at greater risks of cerebrovascular accidents and myocardial infarctions, as well as heart arrhythmias and heart failure. Gerontological considerations, large neck circumference, obesity, and other comorbidities experienced by older adults increase the risk for sleep apnea. Older adults who experience sleep apnea should be carefully evaluated for fall risks owing to cardiopulmonary changes and the tendency to drift into short, frequent daytime naps from which they may have difficulty being aroused. Assessment findings. During sleep, clients with OSA snore loudly with cessation of breathing for at least 10 seconds. These episodes may occur many times within one hour from as few as five to 30 times and up to a total of several hundred per night. Clients awaken suddenly as the PaO2 level drops, usually with a loud snort. Other symptoms include daytime fatigue, morning headache, inability to concentrate when awake, sore throat, enuresis, and erectile dysfunction. Partners may report that the client behaves differently and is not the same in personality as, and that the snoring progressively worsens. Initial diagnosis is made according to the client's reported symptoms. These include symptoms of sleep apnea, such as loud snoring, gasping or snorting, morning headaches, or unusual tingling sensations or muscle jerking in the extremities. Sleep partners are sometimes better to answer these questions. Clients may be asked to keep a sleep diary for a few weeks, recording how many hours of sleep a night and how many times they wake up during the night and how long it takes to fall asleep, how rested they feel when they wake up, and if they experience sleepiness during the day. To determine the nature of the sleep apnea, clients undergo polysomnography, which consists of tests that monitor the client's respiratory and cardiac status while asleep. Specifically, a polysomnogram rec records a client's brain activity, eye movement, muscle movement, 
respiratory and heart rates, and the amount of air that moves in and out of the lungs and the oxygen concentration in the blood. Clients stay overnight at a sleep study lab and have electrodes and other monitors placed on their scalps, face, chest, and extremities. If OSA is diagnosed during the first half of the sleep study, clients will be placed on continuous positive airway pressure called CPAP, C-P-A-P, for the rest of the night to determine if the sleep patterns improve. Oximetry may be done to monitor and record oxygen levels while a client sleeps. With OSA, oxygen levels drop during sleep and rise when the client awake, awakens. Healthcare providers may have clients do portable monitoring at home, which is a home version of polysomnography. Treatment for sleep apnea focuses on improving the quality of nighttime sleep and daytime wakefulness, as well as reducing risks for cardiovascular problems. Depending on the severity of sleep apnea, clients may change their lifestyle to include the following. Lose weight, exercise regularly, quit smoking, eliminate alcohol or other medications that depress respirations and contribute to inability to maintain an open airway, use special pillows to keep clients in a sideline position when sleeping, use allergy medications or saline nasal spray to reduce congestion and dryness. Another treatment is fitting the client for an oral appliance that assists in adjusting the lower jaw and tongue so that the area of the airway remains open while the client is sleeping. A dentist or orthodontist fits the client with a custom-made oral appliance. Additional treatment includes the use of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation called NPPV, which is the application of positive pressure through a full face mask, a nasal mask, or cannula with supplemental oxygen to enhance ventilation. There are two commonly used types, CPAP and BiPAP. CPAP provides constant airway pressure during inspiration and expiration. Bi-level positive airway pressure, BiPAP, provides two levels of pressure, inspiratory and expiratory airway pressures. With this treatment, the client receives airway pressure either through his or her own inspirations or by machine-initiated inspirations. A set number of breaths are delivered. Clients often are not compliant because they do not like the continuous pressure of CPAP or the varying pressures of BiPAP or do not like using equipment and oxygen every night. In addition, these methods do not completely eliminate the problem. A newer technology referred to as Auto Titrating Continuous Positive Airway Pressure, APAP, automatically adjusts airway pressure as needed. Side effects of positive pressure ventilation include dry mouth, rhinitis, and sinus congestion. Surgical procedures may be done to relieve the obstruction. The most common surgery is uvulopharyngeoplasty, UPPP, a surgical procedure to remove tissues in the throat, including the uvula, palate, and pharynx to relieve obstruction. Modified procedures can be done with laser or with radiofrequency energy to reduce snoring. Jaw surgery involves maxillomandibular advancement, which involves moving the upper and lower parts of the jaw forward in order to increase the space behind the tongue and soft palate, which decreases the obstruction. This is generally done by an oral surgeon. Complications may include bleeding, mouth numbness, infection, or problems with the temporomandibular joint. For clients who experience mild OSA, a PILAR, P -I -L -L -A -R, procedure may be performed. It involves the insertion of three small polyester rods in the soft palate. These rods become stiff and add support to soft palate tissue, reducing its collapse and thus decreasing snoring. Tracheostomy is a successful treatment Clients may reject this option, however, because of the trauma, the seemingly barbaric nature of the procedure, and the alteration that it creates in appearance. Tracheostomy also may be technically difficult if the client is markedly obese. If a client chooses to have a tracheostomy, he or she may plug it during the day. Medication sometimes is prescribed for central sleep apnea, and clients take such drugs at bedtime. The goal is to increase the respiratory drive and improve upper airway muscle tone. An example of a medication for this purpose is Vivactyl or Triptyl. Clients may also use low flow oxygen at night to relieve hypoxemia. Nursing management. Clients with sleep apnea usually are anxious and require reassurance and adequate instruction about their 
condition. The nurse provides thorough explanations of the disease process, polysomnography, and treatments referring clients to self-help groups or to appropriate counseling for weight loss or alcohol and substance abuse issues. The nurse collaborates with respiratory therapists to instruct the client in the use of CPAP or other NPPV and furnishes the client with information about sleep apnea and its potential complications if not treated. Laryngeal cancer. With early detection, cancer of the larynx has a high potential for cure. Preventative health measures focus on early consultation for persistent hoarseness and other changes in voice quality. Laryngeal cancer is the most common in people after the age of 65 and accounts for over half of head and neck cancers. Men are affected four times more frequently than women. The cause of laryngeal cancer is unknown. Carcinogens such as tobacco, smokeless tobacco, secondhand smoke, alcohol, and industrial pollutants are associated with laryngeal cancer. In addition, chronic laryngitis, specific viruses such as the HPV virus and acid reflux may be factors. As noted above, people over the age of 65 years and men more than women are at risk. Laryngeal cancer is more prevalent in African Americans and whites. Most laryngeal malignancies are squamous cell carcinomas, that is, malignancies arising from epithelial cells lining the larynx. The tumor may be located on the glottis, the true vocal cords, above the glottis, supraglottis, or false vocal cords, or below the glottis, subglottis. Assessment findings. Laryngeal cancers that start in the glottis generally cause persistent and progressive hoarseness longer than two weeks, which is usually the earliest symptom. The hoarseness may be slight at first and clients tend to ignore it. Cancers that start elsewhere in the larynx may not cause hoarseness until later and therefore may not be diagnosed as early. Later the client notes a sensation of swelling or a lump in the throat or in the neck followed by dysphagia and pain when talking. The client may also complain of burning in the throat when swallowing hot or citrus liquids. Weight loss often occurs owing to reduced calorie intake as a result of impaired swallowing and pain. If the malignant tissue is not removed promptly, symptoms of advancing carcinoma such as dyspnea, weakness, weight loss, enlarged cervical lymph nodes, pain, and anemia develop. Halitosis or bad breath is also characteristic of laryngeal cancer. Clients may complain of earaches. Diagnostic findings. Visual examination of the larynx, laryngoscopy, and fine needle aspiration biopsy confirms the diagnosis and identify the type of malignancy. For clients who have difficulty swallowing, a barium swallow may be done. In addition, imaging tests such as x-rays, endoscopy, CT scanning, MRI, and PET scans are also used to detect metastasis and to, de and to determine tumor size. The physician also assesses the mobility of the vocal cords. Limited mobility indicates that the tumor growth is affecting the surrounding tissue, muscle, and airway. Medical and surgical management. Treatment depends on factors such as the size of the lesion, the client's age, and metastasis. Medical treatment may include chemotherapy, which appears to have only minimal effects, and radiation therapy, either alone or with surgery. Surgical treatment includes laser surgery for early lesions or a partial or total laryngectomy. In more advanced cases, total laryngectomy may be the treatment of choice. If the disease has extended beyond the larynx, a radical neck dissection which is removal of the lymph nodes, muscles, and adjacent tissues is performed. Laser surgery may also be used to, to relieve obstruction in more advanced cases. Chemotherapy and radiation therapy may be used in conjunction with a surgical procedure to treat throat cancers. Herbitux, E-R-B-I-T-U-X, is a targeted drug therapy specifically used for laryngeal cancer. Other drugs are in trial stages. A client with a total laryngectomy has a permanent tracheal stoma or opening because the trachea is no longer connected to the nasopharynx. The larynx is severed from the trachea and removed completely. The only respiratory organs in use are the trachea, bronchi, and lungs. Air enters and leaves through the tracheostomy. The client no longer feels air entering the nose. Because the anterior wall of the esophagus connects with the posterior wall of the larynx, it must be reconstructed. Tube feeding facilitates healing by preventing muscle activity and irritation of the esophagus. 
Loss of the ability to speak normally is a devastating consequence of laryngeal surgery. Clients with a malignancy of the larynx require emotional support before and after surgery and help in understanding and choosing an alternative method of speech. Some methods of laryngeal speech used after a laryngectomy include the following. Esophageal speech requires regurgitation of swallowed air and formation of words with lips. Voice quality will be lower pitched and gruff sounding, but more natural. Artificial electric larynx, a throat vibrator held against the neck that projects sound into the mouth. Words are formed with the mouth and the resulting voice sounds mechanical. Tracheoesophageal puncture, TEP, a surgical opening in the posterior wall of the trachea, followed by the insertion of a prosthesis, such as a Blom Singer device. Air from the lungs is diverted through the opening in the posterior tracheal wall to the esophagus and out of the mouth. The client covers the stoma with his or her finger and forces air through the esophagus, thus causes the walls of the throat to vibrate as the client speaks. It sounds more natural than an artificial larynx. A speech pathologist works with the client to use an artif artificial speech device, learn esophageal speech, or speak clearly with a prosthesis. Clients having a partial laryngectomy also may require speech therapy. Clients with serious airway conditions require aggressive treatment to maintain an airway or relieve airway obstruction. Tracheotomy and tracheostomy. A tracheotomy is the surgical procedure that makes an opening into the trachea. A tracheostomy is a surgical opening into the trachea into which a tracheostomy or laryngectomy or laryngectomy is tube is inserted. A tracheostomy may be temporary or permanent. A permanent opening in the trachea is required for certain disorders such as laryngectomy or laryngeal cancer. Nursing management. Diagnosis for nurses would be risk for ineffective airway clearance. You want to assess for breath sounds, vital signs that are stable, assess skin color, level of consciousness and mental status, and airway patency. And airway patency is your priority. You also have a risk for infection. You need to monitor the stoma, provide routine tracheostomy care, and positioning is important. You want to keep them up in a semi-fowler's position to promote uh, expansion of the lungs and risk for ineffective management of therapeutic regimen if the patient is, let's say, pulling on the tube and you can't suction them, there's interventions for that. Um, and if the tube is coming out, there's an interventions for that as well. You do not want to put the tube back in if the patient coughed it out. You have a danger of occluding the opening and causing um, respiratory emergency. Endotracheal intubation and mechanical ventilation. An endotracheal tube is inserted through the mouth or nose into the trachea to provide a patent airway for clients who cannot maintain an adequate airway on their own. Examples include those with respiratory difficulty, comatose clients, those undergoing general anesthesia, and clients with extensive swelling of the upper airway passages. An endotracheal tube can remain in place for up to two weeks. The cuff is inflated to provide a tight seal. The endotracheal tube is attached to a ventilator for control of respirations and ventilation of the lungs. Humidification is necessary because air going into the lungs through an endotracheal tube does not pass through the moist mucous membranes of the upper airway. There are several modes of mechanical ventilation classified according to the manner in which they support ventilation. Two major classifications are negative pressure and positive pressure ventilations, ventilators. Negative pressure ventilators exert negative pressure, a pulling or sucking force, on the external chest. Although widely used at one time for clients with chronic respiratory failure related to neuromuscular disease such as poliomyelitis or myasthenia gravis, this mode is rarely, rarely used now. Negative modes include iron lungs or respiratory tanks or pneumo-wrap and chest cuirass, C-U-I-R-A-S-S, -S, a plastic shell-like apparatus that fits over the chest. The second classification, positive pressure ventilators, are more commonly used. 
These types of ventilators inflate the lungs by exerting positive pressure, pushing air into the airway. Positive pressure ventilators generally require intubation and are used for clients with acute respiratory failure and primary lung disease, such as cystic fibrosis, or for clients who are comatose, are under general anesthesia, or have extensive upper airway swelling. Complications related to mechanical ventilation include damage to the lungs, decreased lung expansion, and ventilator-associated pneumonia, called VAP. Accidental removal of an endotracheal tube must be prevented because this can result in laryngeal edema or laryngeal spasm, which is spasm of the laryngeal muscles resulting in narrowing of the larynx and subsequent respiratory arrest. The inflated cuff and placement of tape around the tube attached to the client's cheek secures the endotracheal tube. The proximal end of the tube is marked for determining if downward place displacement has occurred. Nursing management for the intubated client are to improve, focused on improving respirations, maintaining a patent airway, and communicating needs to others. The nurse monitors vital signs periodically depending on the client's condition and the reason for endotracheal tube insertion. Blood gas studies and pulse ox provide methods of ongoing evaluation of the client's respiratory status. The nurse reviews the results of these studies and reports the changes to the physician. The nurse observes the client at frequent intervals for response to respiratory support and complications associated with endotracheal intub intubation. He or she evaluates any change in mental status. Confusion may result from abnormal blood gas levels or electrolyte imbalances. Sudden restlessness or agitation may indicate obstruction of the endotracheal tube, which can be life-threatening. The nurse auscultates the lungs and observes the symmetric rise and fall of the chest every 30 to 60 minutes. If bilateral breath sounds cannot be detected, the nurse notifies the physician immediately. Humidification is necessary to keep the inspired air moist. Clients with endotracheal intub intubation cannot cough. Secretions are often thick and tenacious, and swallowing reflexes are depressed. An increase in PaCO2 caused by blockage of the endotracheal tube or malfunctioning of the ventilator may occur secondary to secretions or because the client is biting on the tube. Keeping the airway patent at all times is absolutely necessary, using the same suctioning technique as for a tracheostomy. If the client is biting on the tube, a bite block or oral airway may be used to keep the tube patent. The nurse changes the client's position every two hours to prevent atelectasis and gives oral care as needed to keep the mouth and lips free of crusts and mucus. The nurse suctions the oropharynx and mouth as needed and cleans the teeth with applicators. The nurse inspects the oral cavity frequently and reports any sign of oral bleeding to the doctor. The client may display anxiety or fear because of the tube, inability to speak, suctioning, and dependence on a machine for breathing. Each time suctioning is needed, the nurse reassures the client that the procedure takes only a short time. The client may attempt to remove or pull on the tube if he or she is awake or partially awake. Restraining the client may be necessary. The nurse should contact the doctor if the client is extremely restless. Providing a magic slate whiteboard, electronic device, or pencil and pen to the client enables communication, as does asking questions that the client can answer by shaking the head yes or no. Once the endotracheal tube is removed, the nurse places the client in a high fowler's or semi fowler's position to promote optimal chest and lung expansion. The posterior pharynx may be dry and the voice may be hoarse. The nurse, the nurse observes the client frequently for signs of laryngeal edema and increased respiratory distress. He or she immediately reports any sign of respiratory distress because reinsertion of the endotracheal tube may be necessary. And this is the end of the slideshow.